Thanks for, thanks for having me. So um, Corey gave me a pretty suitable introduction. Um, I, I do want to say a few words about the format of this talk. Um, I haven't tried this before, but I'm going to, instead of just running through points about product management, I'm going to run through product management related trivia questions for you guys. So I'm going to ask a question. You guys are going to answer the question. Um, I think we'll just do the like yell it out thing rather than the raise hand things because yelling sounds more fun than raising hands. Um, and if you answer a question right, um, come at, come up to me after the talk, and I have some cool swag. So, um, also I'm going to try to leave plenty of room for questions at the end. So if you guys have questions, store them up and don't be afraid to ask. All right, so uh, before we jump into the trivia proper, I just want to get a sense from the room by way of show of hands. Uh, how many people in the room work in tech? 99% or something. Um, OK, so that's logical. Um, how many people work at a product company, like a company that has its own digital product as opposed to an agency or consultancy or something? OK, maybe 50%? Um, how many people work at a product company that has somebody on staff with the title product manager? 20, 25%, something like that? Okay. Uh, how many people in the room are a product manager? <laughs> okay, it was like seven, seven people, it's good. Uh, all right, I was hoping for zero because then nobody could question my authority on the topic, but. <laughs> Uh, that's fine, seven's fine. So, all right, let's jump into it. Product manage management trivia, right, right? Okay. So, uh, question number one, trivia question number one. Before he became a... All right, okay, I'm gonna read the question out loud, but before he became a VC and published The Hard Thing About Hard Things, this guy, Ben Horowitz, uh, was one of Netscape's first product managers, and you guessed correct, is that Jake? Yes. Very good job, Jake. Uh, ben Horowitz has answered that question. Um, and then I asked this question not so much because the hard thing about hard things is interesting, although it is an interesting book and you should read it, but um, I, I think it's kind of interesting that this like VC entrepreneur guy who is a real thought leader in this space um, sort of started in a product management role. That's where he sort of has his, his roots in the industry. Um, and I also just wanted to use it as an excuse to call out a document that he wrote, um, good product manager, bad product manager. Um, product management's a thing that I think is pretty ill-defined. Like, if I asked 10 people what a product manager does, I'd get 10 different definitions. Um, when people ask me what a product manager does, I usually tell them to read good product manager, bad product manager. Uh, for me, it's the closest thing to a product management Bible. Um, so it's a great document. If you're interested in product management, I, you should read it. I'm going to read a few excerpts that I liked just to give you guys a little teaser. But you should go and look it up on the old internet and read it yourself. Um, a few excerpts. A good product manager takes full responsibility and measures themselves in terms of the success of the product. They are responsible for right product, right time, and all that entails. Good product managers anticipate the serious product flaws and build real solutions. Bad product managers put out fires all day. Good product managers decompose problems. Bad product managers combine all problems into one. Good product managers err on the side of clarity and explaining the obvious. Bad product managers never explain the obvious. So that's your teaser. Hopefully you guys are um, already hooked. And we'll go look up Ben Horowitz. Um, all right. Trivia question number two. So in this document, I didn't read the whole thing. I didn't read the first or the second line. The second line, I believe, in the document is a good product manager is the what of the product? Is the Ben Horowitz of the product? It's a good answer, but the correct answer is over here, CEO. A good product manager is the CEO of the product. Um, 
Uh, that's kind of how he introduces the role of, of product manager, which I think is interesting in general, but it's, a, it's especially interesting if you're at a startup, because um, you might ask if you're at a startup, isn't the CEO the CEO of the product? Um, and I think often the answer is yes. Probably for a lot of startups, it makes sense for the CEO to basically be playing the role of product manager. Um, but there are a few cases where that might not make sense. If the CEO can't for any reason be totally product centric, um, they may need somebody else to, to play that role for them. So for instance, maybe the CEO just doesn't have time to be totally product centric and to um, you know, dream solely about the product vision. Uh, maybe the, the, the CEO has more of a sales background and feels like they're better at sort of worrying about the customer and reacting and not so much being an editor and defender of the, the vision or something like that. Um, so that is why a, a startup might actually have a PM and not just a um, CEO. So who, what? Owner. Owner. That seems like a reasonable answer. Not the one that Ben Horowitz picked, but a reasonable answer. You could probably fill a lot of reasonable answers into this sentence. <laughs> um, owner. Makes sense. Image? Image? Yeah. The, the, a good product manager is the image of the product? Yeah. All right. Like, is the vision maybe, or he sort of, he or she manifests the vision of the product? Makes sense? Champion. I also, again, heard Ben Horowitz of the product back there. I like that answer, too. All right, so anyway, we're going we're gonna to move on to the next trivia question. Because unfortunately, this trivia question does only have one right answer. <laughs> well, they're all delightful answers. Oh, there is a little effect where it says CEO. Okay, so actually, this isn't really a trivia question. This is kind of a cheating question. But do you guys remember from when we did the whole hands thing and you guys said what you were and some of you were product managers? Yeah, what, what percentage of the people that work at a product company roughly actually have a PM? Yeah, it was like nothing. It was not north of 50, I would say. It was probably a minority number, maybe close to 50. Um, so so I, I was doing some thinking. I, I just put question marks here because I did not know beforehand what the answer to that question would be. Um, I was thinking about like, what do you do in that in that case, right? Where you have a product and you need somebody to, to be, you need the value that a product manager offers, hopefully, um, but you don't have a product manager proper. What are the things that should be on your mind? And my ha having not worked as a product manager at a company that doesn't have a product manager, my information comes from talking to other people and thinking a lot about what the value of a product manager actually is. Um, but I, I think my hypothesis is that there's two pillars. There's two like pieces of value that you need to bring into your, you know, product-centric workplace if you don't have a product manager proper. Um, the first is you need some kind of checkpoint. Um, it doesn't have to be a person. It could be a person who's not a PM proper. Uh, it could be a weekly meeting where you hold everything else up against the long-term product vision. Um, and evaluate it in that light. Because that's, that's a big part of the value of having a product manager. It's the person in the meeting who's not just reacting to a customer, and not just reacting to an opportunity, um, not just thinking about you know, the, the dollar today, but thinking about the long-term product vision. If you're a product company, that's super important. So finding some other way to insert that sort of moment of clarity and actually like putting some boundaries around it, not just saying, oh, everybody looks out for the product, because you can't do that. You're looking out for whatever's you know, whatever you're tackling that day. So having some kind of defined um, moment or structure that allows you to actually hold stuff up against the long-term vision for the product, I think, is key. The other thing that's key, and this is important if you have a product manager too, but something that you might have to be extra conscious of if you don't have a product manager, um, is bridging the gap between the why and the what. So, you know, at a company, um, a product company, there's usually more than one person actually making decisions every day that will have significant consequence for um, the product that comes out the other side. And I, I think part of a product manager's job is to supply all of the people making those decisions with the right context so that they can make good decisions. Um, not just good decisions, but decisions that are in line with the product vision. Um, so if you don't have a product manager taking on that burden, somebody else has to, or some group of people have to, and you have to be asking yourself, does everybody have the right information to make decisions that are in line with the product vision? All right, so getting a little bit less abstract, perhaps, um, some things that I think are important to product manager types, like myself. Uh, Chris Gale warns us about 
quote, complexity cost in this fantastic online publication with Philly Roots. So I'm looking for the online publication. First round review. First round review. That was strong efforts from this side of the room over here. Yeah, first round review. So the point is not so much first round review, though also a fantastic thing that you should read if you don't, and a lot of product-centric content. Um, but I really liked the way, uh, I really liked this particular article. It was derived from an interview with Chris Gale, who is the um, VP of Engineering at Yammer. And he talks about complexity costs, and he doesn't mean technical debt. Um, that's something that's probably on a lot of people's mind in this room. Technical debt is a real thing that should be thought about. Um, but complexity cost is basically all of the things that come after actually building something. So uh, Chris has a good quote that I think I wrote down. I did. Um, he says, I'd argue that the initial time spent implementing a feature is one of the least interesting data points to consider when weighing the cost and benefit of a feature. So like a big part of being a PM is not just thinking, is this a good idea, but what's the ROI? Like, is it a worthwhile idea, not a good idea? Um, and so it's pretty tempting to just ask the question, how much does it cost to build this? Um, but his point is that how much it costs to build it is often a poor proxy for how much it costs to, to maintain it and to build against it for the rest of the product's lifetime. Um, and it's so tempting to, to not think about that second part. I think it's like, you, you know, you get really smart people who are really incentivized to think about it, and they still don't think about it. I don't know how. It's like this magical thing where people just don't think about um, what it's going to be, you know, how it's going to affect your product a year from now, two years from now, and so on. And complexity costs can be can come in so many different um, packages. He, he gave a good example of like toggles, right? You know, every time you have a, a screen that has settings on it where you can toggle something on or off, um, each additional setting may be exactly the same effort to, to build it, right? How much would it you know, cost to add another toggle to this page? Why? Why amount of effort? Same, same whether it's the third toggle or the eighth toggle. But the number of states that those toggles, um, additional toggles create starts to do this, right? So you have two toggles, um, you have four possible states. You have four toggles, you have 16 possible states, and so on. Um, and all of those states must be tested, all those code paths have to talk nicely to each other, and so forth. Um, so that's one example. Another is just like communication costs. Like we, we did something at Ticket Leave recently, which I, you know, I agreed to, I actually um, devised, but it was like a manual workaround for something, for unsubscribing people to certain emails where people, if they like didn't want to be on the list, they would let customer success know. And then I would put it in a spreadsheet and, you know, once every two weeks, uh, the engineering team would, would uh, you know, add them to a block list, right? And like, there's probably one person a week that gets added to the list. Um, the value is minimal, but it's like an hour of my time, an hour of engineering time, and you know some amount of customer success time because it's a switching cost and the making sure that the email and the spreadsheet matches a user in our database. It's just like so low value for for not a ton of overhead, but like a little bit of overhead every week. So don't do that. Don't do what I did. Um, if you do it once, probably not at the end of the world. But if you have seven things like that, all of a sudden that's like a day of your work week. So avoid it. Um, oh, I was going to say one more thing about that. I have to check my cards because I have a uh, chronic condition in which I write talks the day of the talk and need to have cards to tell myself what to say. Um, so how do you know whether something's worth it? Because pretty much everything comes with complexity costs. It's not that you can like choose things that don't come with complexity costs. Uh, I think it, it's a simple test, which is, does this move the needle? Is there like a significant upside? Um, I'm oversimplifying it, but I think oftentimes it's tempting to do things because not doing them feels hard. Like if somebody wants something, right, and it doesn't feel hard to implement, it's so tempting to say yes. Um, but hard to say no is not a good reason to say yes. Uh, seeing a big upside is a good reason to say yes. All right. Second to last trivia question. This is a quote. I think you guys will get this. Oh, Tim Ringwald with the uh, this the uh, tricky nobody answer. All right. So so this famous quote is uh, attributed to Henry Ford. In fact, there's no proof that Henry Ford ever said this, based on my crappy internet research anyway. Um, uh, 
doesn't really matter whether he said it or not because it's an interesting point and probably one that he believed in and wish he said if he didn't say it. Um, and it's, it's, it may be the most famous product management quote ever. There's not a lot of famous product management quotes. Um, and it's actually kind of at the center of a debate uh, because some people think that it's somewhat disrespectful to, um, to customer feedback, right? That it sort of diminishes the, the role of the user. Um, for me, the way I rectify this is like, always want feedback, always be hungry for feedback, for requests, for ideas from customers, and then treat each one of those units as a piece of data, not as instructions. Um, so, so if you're a product manager or somebody who's sort of playing a product manager role, um, that, those data points, that's kind of your gold, right? Like you want to be the owner of the biggest pile of data points. You don't really want to even burden other people with like being keepers of those data points. Like that's, that's a good role for you to play is to like covet those data points, to want your pile to get bigger and bigger, um, to, to get basically make your, your data richer. Um, but if you just do that and then you don't edit it or analyze it in any way, you're a horrible product manager. So, um, so draw in as many things as you can into the pile, but be a careful editor and, um, and analyzer of that data is my advice. Um, I don't know if it's Henry Ford's advice. Okay, so this is the very last trivia question. It's kind of a poor trivia question, but sorry. Um, this XY Combinator president encourages startups to build a product that just one to three people love. Paul Graham. I think he's the only XY Combinator president. So, um, so yeah, I, this isn't even a documented thing. I just saw a Paul Graham talk where I think he, he said something that was interesting to me, which is he advises his startups to, um, to find like maybe just one, maybe two, maybe three uh, uh, power users, like perfect target power users who are critical and would be like exactly who you want to be using the product and just learn everything you can from them and make the product like soar for them. And if you do that, It'll be easier to get the 1,000 users by making those three users love your product than sort of like talking to the 1,000 users and making them kind of like it and splitting the difference. Um, and also probably kind of a more of a like continuum thing and less of a binary thing, but I, I think it's a really important point. I think the, the, the shortest path to greatness is, is focus. Um, and when you do something with a lot of integrity and a lot of focus, people outside of that path end up loving it. Um, I think it's hard to build something that people love if you're kind of all over the path. Um, so it's good to know that Paul Graham at least agrees. That's a pretty good uh, endorsement to that idea. So for some, for some companies, that, that means like a really good set of personas. For some companies, it maybe means like you have three customers that you, that, you know, are your power users that you talk to every week or something like that. Or maybe it's, a, it's all of those things and, and more, but I think it's, it's really critical. Um, and it doesn't require having a product manager proper to, to think of it that way. So that is the end of the trivia. I don't think I have any more slides. Oh, Paul Graham. Um, any questions? The gentleman in the aqua shirt. <laughs> so, uh, so um, one of the things I see at startups quite frequently in small product teams is like, there's a spectrum of development process that kind of goes from like instinct driven to like process driven, right? And both have trade-offs. And if you're instinct driven, like you're kind of making decisions on the fly, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, and you yearn for more process, but then if you're totally process-driven, you're kind of like impacting freedom of thought and development, and so you yearn for that. And a lot of times at a startup, you're just flat out constrained, and it's like, like we got the data to like some percentage level, but somebody needs to make the call. And so, like how can, whether it's a product manager or someone functioning as a product manager at a small company, like how do you find the right point in time where you're gonna go for it, and how do you just like kind of make that so to say like we're, this is where we're at and this is where we're going we're gonna give a shot yeah uh good question i mean there, there's some there's some questions like that that i, I feel like the answer is like a good product manager solves that for you. Like there's a little bit of like magic pixie dust or something in, in the good product manager where like basically instincts are really good. Like, you know, sp sort of a keen spidey sense is like maybe the number one thing you could look for in a product manager. Um, and so I don't know how to, how to um, 
sort of pick that ap apart entirely. Um, but I think certainly like anything that uh, allows you to to do something fast and then test it with real people is one good way to get around it. Because even, I mean, Spidey Sense is only so good anyway. So even if you have the world's best product manager, I, I would say like unless you have Steve Jobs as your product manager, you might want to do something um, a little bit like rough and find a way to test it early. If you have Steve Jobs as your product manager, you just do whatever the hell you want and then launch it in five years and it's great. So, um, yeah. I think so. I think every time you put something in front of a user, you probably learn something you didn't know. Or if you don't, it means you overworked it in the first place. So you, you probably spent more time like learning the things on your own than you would have just putting it in front of a, a user. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned it. Do, you, do you believe in focus groups? You know, I mean, in the technology area, I found that you way you present whatever you're going to have them focus on can influence them, or is it still of any value? Yeah, to be honest, I've never run a focus group proper or even been in one. So I, I don't know if focus group is always the right format. Um, I think some kind of you know conversation with users. For me, that's like I, I like doing that really casually. Um, I like will run through users, like just look through Ticket Leap data and just start reaching out to people, like just sending emails and saying like, hi, I'm a crazy person you don't know, emailing you, give me this feedback. And about 50% of people respond and I get on the phone with them and I always learn something and it's really interesting. Um, probably if I were like, you know, had UX as my background, if I were a UX researcher, I would say that's stupid and you should do something a little bit like more formal and, and have a research methodology. Um, which also seems fine. I feel like as long as you're talking to customers, there's probably, like, there's probably, you're going to get better. Um, there may be, the, the right way to do it may depend on the question and the product and so forth. What yeah. What your impression and what did you learn at Google and what, what did they do good and what did they do poorly? What did, yeah. Repeat the question, sure. So the, uh, the question was, I think, you can tell me if this is right, uh, what at Google, what do I think, uh, when I was at Google, what do I think they were doing well and what do I think they were doing poorly? Um, honestly, I have like nothing but love for, for Google. I, I feel, um, I feel like I really learned how to be a, a useful person in tech and product manager specifically there. I think it, I mean, it's a huge company and so their challenges are many and they, they misstep sometimes. I think, and in some ways, it did feel like a large company. You can't really be a 30,000 person company or what, it's probably more than that now, um, without feeling like a large company in some ways. Um, but they did a pretty damn good job of like trying to feel as small as a 30,000 person company could feel. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that's not a very like juicy answer, but um, <laughs> I, was, I was pretty, I guess, the honest answer this is not like, you know, playing it safe. The honest answer is I was pretty impressed as an internal person at Google. Like, they didn't get everything right, but, but um, I have a lot of fond feelings. And if you want to work at a 30,000 person company, it's a pretty, it can be a pretty great place to be. Yeah. If you're a product company looking to acquire a product manager, does it matter how early you are in the Yeah. So the question is, if you want, if you're, if you're hiring, right, a, a, a product person, do you, do you, th is it more of a like product marketing role or a product management role? Yeah. I just today, Tim, who's sitting over there, is my CEO, and I were talking about the like bleeding lines between marketing and and product development, and they're totally bleeding. Um, and I, my opinion is that a good product manager sort of has um, an interest in, in both. Um, I think a product manager is kind of a weird role in that you straddle lots of different functions. So like I, I love sitting next, I sit really close to our customer success team and that's really important to me because I can hear like what they're talking to. In the back of my mind, I'm kind of processing like the conversations they're having with customers. I can hear if things start to sound like something's a little weird that day or if there's themes coming up. 
Um, so I, th I think if you're if you hire a really great product manager, they're also going to be working very closely with marketing and thinking about the message and you know how the product presents itself and presents its value proposition. Um, I don't know if that does that answer your question. Right. Yes, sir. Perhaps you feel that further as a position of product management versus engineering. Yeah. Uh, so the question was how would I how would I sort of position product management and development, um, so the technical side of the world. Uh, Corey mentioned earlier that I was this like weird case at Google where I, I became a product manager without a computer science background. That's something that they they are, um, it's like a Sergey Larry level principle that product managers should be computer scientists. So all kinds of crazy exceptions had to be made and it was a total pain in the butt. Um, so I, I think a lot of people would tell you that a product manager should have like the technical chops. Um, and it's probably a pretty reasonable point of view, not one that I can like advocate very strongly because I don't have the technical chops. Um, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I think my job is to, to work extremely closely with our engineering team and to give them the tools that they need uh, to make good decisions. Because I don't want to make every decision for them. Like a product, ha there's a product vision, but then in reality, the uh, product is a um, is sort of the you know pile of a million decisions that were made in the meantime. Um, so I, I try to create a relationship with our engineering team where. I have a sense of whether they have the context that they need to, to make good decisions and to have a certain degree of, of freedom to make those decisions um, and have the output still kind of be in line with, with what I'm hoping to see out, out the other side. Yeah. Similar questions on the sales side. Um, you shed some light on the love-hate relationship between product and yeah. I, so the question was, how, how would I position product management against sales? Which is funny, right? Like these questions are just sort of implicitly highlighting what a blurry role it is. It's like, what's the difference between product management and marketing? What's the difference between product, mar product uh, management and tech? What's the difference between product management and sales? Um, it's sort of maybe a similar answer. Like, I, I like to keep one toe inside our, we don't have a, a sales team, but we have an account management and customer success team. And at Google, I had a sales team. Um, I, I think it's important that I'm in constant dialogue with those teams and that they understand the product vision and that the, it's a two-way street, right? Like, both that they're getting information from me um, about where the product's going and, and, like, enough that they can actually get on board and sell it to their clients. Um, and also that I'm getting information in from them and they feel like they're being heard and their clients are being heard and, and know that that data is kind of going into the pile, so to speak. Um, I don't think a product manager's job is to, to sell to individual clients. I think in a way a product manager's part of a, a, their job is to sell to a sales team, though. I mean, if the sales team's not picking up what you're putting down, then you're, you're, you either need to reconsider what you're putting down or you need to talk about it differently or something. One more question. Oh, gosh. All right. You, I think you had your hand up for a while. So, yeah. Yeah. OK. I don't know if we addressed this yet or not, but how would you compare the uh, text team in Silicon Valley with here in Philly? And um, which one do you like better? Hmm, that's a loaded question. Uh, how would I compare the, <laughs> the, the tech scene in Silicon Valley to the tech scene in Philadelphia, and which do I like better? Um, i say the Silicon Valley one is larger. Uh, <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, it's so different. It's, it's kind of like working at um, Google and working at Ticket Leap. Um, I love them both very much. They're totally different. Like, I really, I mean, the thing that I've enjoyed about being in the tech scene here in Philly is that it feels like it's this new, young, fragile thing that, like, I have a, a chance to actually be part of its development and, and part of its sort of maturation. Um, and I think that's really cool and really energizing. I love the idea that, like, you know, 20 years from now, it could be a lot bigger, and I felt like I was part of that. Um, and that in Silicon Valley, you don't have that at all. Like, it's just like this whole universe that, you know, you, you could be a pretty senior executive at Google, and you could just feel like another cog in the Silicon Valley wheel, you know? Um, 
on the flip side, I'd say the thing that that I miss sometimes, uh, this is my, my hard feedback for Philly, I guess, is that there is this sort of sense of like, let's do the impossible, let's aim really high, let's do like really crazy things that are going to change the world, just sort of like cultural undercurrent in Silicon Valley that I don't feel here yet. Um, not because there aren't like big thinking, big dreaming people here, but it's just not like woven into the culture yet in the way it is in Silicon Valley. Um, so that's the thing that I sort of hope Philly develops over the coming years, because I think it's awesome and liberating and empowering. Um, and I've, I'm kind of excited to be here and watch that happen. All right.